Um, I'm going to start off by saying that, that um, I think there's a tendency to, um, among some, to, to assume that those who want to um, defend the right of protest during the Olympics to, to be people who are against the Olympics or something. I actually hope it's a fantastic success. I hope it showcases um, our province as, as uh, you know, as a great place. And, and in particular, I guess, you know, the criteria that's important to me is is that it showcases our province as a very progressive democracy that that celebrates diversity of people and diversity of opinions. And so that's that's where I come from. A, a, a democracy quickly loses its legitimacy if it's one that starts to silence opposition. And uh, and you know, Olympics in various places are a little bit notorious for that. Um, even in you know in you know the land of the First Amendment, America, the Atlanta Olympics, um, you know, were had some problems that way. So. So that's where I start, and, and um, um, you know, I hope that the, the legacy is not a shameful one of silencing protest and PR exercise, but one of, of, uh, of really embracing, embracing democratic values. Um, what I want to spend a moment on is, is just positioning the concept of free speech a little bit. Um, you know, there's a tendency, I think, to think, well, free speech is just the freedom to speak. Um, and in fact, it encompasses, and, and our Supreme Court has, has um, accepted that it encompasses a lot more than just that. Uh, it includes things like you know, the right of listeners to receive information. So, so it's no good to have somebody who, who can speak freely if the, the zone that they can speak from really is not uh, in, in the presence of any, of any audience that's relevant. Um, or if they can't speak at a, at a, at a time and place that, that, uh, that receives an audience. It even includes the right to, to gather information. So, you know, if, 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 if um, authorities are playing hide the ball with, with um, expenditure statistics or, or information on, um, on how many people have been shipped out of town, um, what sort of um, um, tidying up of the city has gone on, those sorts of things, that those are, are relevant things. And, that, and, and part of free expression involves being able to to, um, for, for whether it's a journalist or a blogger or just a concerned citizen to, to get that together and to be able to present it. Olympic events in, in um, well, I'm sorry, public events uh, in Vancouver have a bit of a notorious history and, and if we don't think about those and try to do things a bit differently, it, you know, the, the Olympics are going to be the biggest of them all and, and I, you know, I think I'm concerned about whether history will repeat itself, and, and I'm referring to, you know, things like the 1997 APEC conference, um, you know, even something as seemingly minimal as the cancellation of a Guns N' Roses rock concert leads to a, you know, a huge riot, and, and I think it's fair to say that the, the uh, and I think even the law authorities, police authorities would, would say in hindsight that there were significant overreactions, and, um, you know, to people wanting to, to protest, Signs, whatever they might want to do, and and um, and and the result was the result was you know a, a, a shameful sort of sort of shutting down of, uh, of of free speech and and in in those cases even um, a detention of people. So um, when they when those events come forward, one of the problems that that I think we've seen historically is is there seems to be two things at, at play. One is um, um, a security-minded force, which you know says, "Well, let's let's take things as they come," and if you have that attitude, it's going to escalate very quickly. As opposed to a, as opposed to let's um, let's adopt a very pro, um, you know, pro-freedom, low-key. Let's let's just let's just uh, um, protect security, but not but not go overboard kind of approach. Um, and the other part of that is, is that I think you know it has to be said, um, not to point fingers too directly, but that the, the RCMP in particular has had a, a very um, escalating militaristic approach to, to these kinds of events historically in, in Vancouver and, and nearby, and, and, um, and that, that um, that's one of the reasons that things have escalated so quickly, you know, to the scenes of the of the baton tapping uh, against the plexiglass shields um, kind of line of line of uh, officers. So, just to sort of take those concerns and put them into the um, some of the specific 
uh, aspects that come into play with respect to the Olympic planning. One of the things that is a, that is a significant issue has to do with what's called perimeter zones. Uh, the venues uh, have, you know, are, are, are controlled security venues, um, but the venues themselves sort of end at one spot, and if you look at the map that's, that's been published, security go zones go significantly farther. Um, and they go, they go, they have been trimmed back due to some, some reaction from, from, uh, from people, but they're really still pretty excessive. Um, and there's, you know, discussion about, about security zones being sort of assembly zones, um, that I, I've seen the phrase um, protest pens. You know, if, if, if you've got fences around assembly zones, you're, you're really, you're defining um, things in the wrong way altogether. And so there's certain key locations. You know, if, if, if protest and free speech is to, re is to receive an audience and to be embraced as, as um, you know, um, peaceful expression of, of views, um, then you know, one hot spot, just for example, is, is the, the area between the, the Art Gallery and Georgia Street. Um, and if that area is, is not, you know, uh, free and available for, 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 uh, for people expressing ideas, then, then you know, really we're, we're, we're pushing the issue out. Uh, I know some of the other speakers are going to talk about the, the city bylaws that have come into place, but that's one of the other problems that, that it, it needs to be dealt with. Um, something as basic as advertising space, you know, for Vanock to go and buy up all the billboard space all around Vancouver throughout the Olympics, that's a real concern, and you know, and, and a significant amount of advertising space, and it, and it sort of sends the message, well, you know, what is it? This, this is a not, not just a PR exercise, but a, a prevention of other points of view exercise, I, and I just don't think that that is uh, flattering to Vanock, flattering to Vancouver, flattering to BC. Um, there are two things that I that I think have to happen, or at least you know, my my call would be for these to happen if um, if we're not to repeat history. One of them is that that some of these issues can't be sort of left until until the games begin. And issues about the perimeter zones, issues about about um, you know the you know whether whether um, speech areas are to be penned in or not, all of that. They can't be left until the time. They have to be fixed in advance because, because face it, when, when, we, when we get to day one of the Olympics, in 14 days, nobody's going to get in front of a judge. Nobody's going to you know, be able to do a charter challenge of any of the provisions. I mean, it, it, all, all that's going to be left is hand-wringing at the end of the day that that was embarrassing and unfortunate and shameful. So, so these things have to, be, have to be sorted out in advance. That's point one. And point two is, um, the leadership of the Integrated Security Unit, of the RCMP, and of the Vancouver Police Department, not to mention the, the business leaders who will have private security forces protecting their own, their own properties, need to take a strong public position in favor of, of embracing and not just tolerating peaceful protest and, 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 and free speech. Because if, if you don't have that, then then the trickle-down effect happens, and, and the you know the officer on the beat, um, if if uh, if the message he's or she is getting from from their leadership is just keep things safe and do what you have to do, well that, then you know how it's going to play out. If the message is is you know let's let's you know embrace diversity of opinions, um, and and that comes from the top down, then then uh, then you know that will affect a lot of day-to-day -day or minute-to-minute -minute decisions that occur. And so far, I've seen. None of that. Not from the ISU, not from the RCMP, not from the VPD, um, and uh, and they need to step up and they need to say that so that all those on the ground know it. That's what I have to say. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm coming at the, the issue um, by way of uh, writing a few pieces with another law professor here by the name of. Uh, uh, Wesley Pugh, and we started to look at the issue of police powers during the Olympics about a year ago. And at that time, there wasn't as much information out there about what precisely the police planned to do during the Olympics. And so what we envisioned was something like uh, what the, well, not maybe something as drastic as what we saw around the um, Quebec City Summit a few years ago, where a large portion of Quebec City was, was cordoned off 
there was, you know, there were large security zones. You needed a pass to move in and out of the zone. Um, and, or in, in other uh, large events, public order events around the world where, um, you know, warrantless searches could be carried out or, um, or uh, expression such as signs, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, acoustic uh, expression and so forth are, are prevented or hindered in some way and so on. So we, we, we envisioned something like that taking place in Vancouver and we asked ourselves, is there any authority for this in Canadian law? Are there any statutes that let the police do this? Are there any cases that let the police do this? Um, if we wake up one, if we wake up on the morning of, of the Olympics and find out that this is going on, um, you know, is there authority for this? And what we discovered is that, that there isn't. There, 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 is, there is no statute in Canadian law that authorizes this. And um, the, the powers to do this can't be extrapolated from existing police powers to do things like um, uh, you know, prevent crime or uh, keep order at public events. The case law is uh, very clear that um, police have very limited powers. Uh, they're uh, tightly controlled, as it were, by the courts, and um, they, they don't authorize anything uh, as, as expansive as the closure of, of uh, entire streets or parks or large public spaces. And um, we also looked at a body of cases that talk about the obligations of the government as a property owner. So um, can the government uh, exercise its rights as a property owner in the same way that a private, an, a, a, a private party can, uh, or does it have uh, more obligations? And the case law is clear, and we have, uh, we have very um, strong uh, opinions from the Supreme Court of Canada in, in a number of cases, but the chief among them is a case called the Commonwealth of Canada. Uh, that's not its full title, but... So the gist of it is that um, where the government is the landlord, it has, uh, there's a high standard uh, on the, or high, uh, there's a duty on the part of the government to respect uh, the values of freedom of speech, and that this there will be the government will be held to a high level of scrutiny when uh, when it comes to uh, spaces like streets, parks, or uh, areas that are symbolically connected to to expression, such as you know a, a square or or the space that Daniel mentioned uh, behind the gallery, that kind of thing. Closing that will require a, a high degree of justification, a very good reason. It can't just be closed, uh, you know, uh, for a vague argument about safety. Um, so what we suggested in, in a, a couple of pieces is that um, it would make more sense if, if the government uh, passed law, if there was at least some clarification so that when the Olympics takes place, we don't have confusion on the part of the citizens and, and, and the police as well, that there, there'd be some clarity as to what the rules are. We can then debate about whether those rules are, are constitutional, whether they go too far, and so on. Well, then in the summer, the, uh, the, um, the, the province amended uh, the legislation uh, governing uh, the, the bylaws for, for the city of Vancouver, and, and then the city of Vancouver passed a bylaw saying we're going to do a few things. And uh, what, we, what we were immediately uh, skeptical about were um, I'm just going to list a couple of them because I, I think Margo is going to go on and discuss some in more detail, are um, the, the power on the part of the city to declare, um, to, to create zones of exclusion, so to create security zones around events. One thing about this power is that there's no, um, the, the city itself has a lot of discretion, really unlimited discretion if you read the bylaw as to how big these can be. So it, it just gives the city uh, the blanket power to, to create these. It, there's also a bylaw, as you all know, about signage, which appears to be limited only to commercial expression, So, um, which sounds innocuous, but uh, I think that given a reading of the cases, uh, it would be, um, I think it's going to be a, an uphill battle for the city to uh, have that uh, passed as constitutional. Um, I, I, you know, the line in the cases is certainly, there's no line suggesting that a, a limitation on commercial speech can be justified. Um, and uh, finally, there's also a talk of the use of airport-style security and uh, the suggestion of warrantless searches or searches on grounds of something less than uh, what is called for in, in the criminal law. Uh, not to mention the business about uh, entering a premises, a, a dwelling house within 
24 hours after notice. I, 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 I agree with uh, the prevailing opinion out there, um, also voiced by the BC Civil Liberties, that that's not likely to, to uh, withstand constitutional scrutiny. But so, for, in all likelihood, um, the, the, the bylaw will be amended. So there's, there's talk that, that they'll amend it. Will it make the charter challenge that is uh, now pending uh, against the bylaw, will it make it moot? Uh, it depends on whether uh, the amendment deals with all of the issues in the challenge. That would be nice to see. Uh, but then the question would be, um, if, if, you know, if, if the bylaw were entirely struck or were amended and just removed, well then we would be back to square one. So what are the rules then around the creation of zones of exclusion, the removal of, of signs or the, or the regulation of expression and so on? Um, we think uh, this is a problem that needs to be addressed. The other thing to mention about the bylaw is that it doesn't entirely answer our call for law because it only deals with Vancouver and, and uh, and so what about Whistler, what about other places? Um, it, it, it's, uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't address all of the, um, the events. Um, and even if it did, we would still say, we think that the larger issue that comes out of this exercise is that um, there should be some clarification on this issue in Canadian law. Otherwise, um, to some extent, we wouldn't be here if, if, there, if the law was clear and if it were already subject to constitutional scrutiny. Um, I'm not sure whether I should uh, go any further, maybe just save it for the end. Okay. Great. Um, well, I'm really pleased to be here, and thanks to Dante and the others who, I, I don't know, but I know we're probably instrumental as well to organizing this panel. Um, I think these discussions are very important. The Olympics is, after all, a a significant event for our city, and that's not simply because of the international spotlight, the thousands of visitors coming, and the excitement around the games and the competitions themselves, but really because it's a major set of spending decisions, allocation of public resources, and also about key significant policy changes and reshifting of our urban environment that go alongside with the staging of these events and, and you're facing this on the campus yourselves if any of you are in residences you've already been come embroiled in a little mini sort of microcosm of some of the, the speech issues. So I think it's key that we spend time thinking critically about the spending regulatory policy decisions, social decisions that circle around the orbit or that orbit around the Olympics. Now I want to spin a tale that has its, its sort of central gravitational points, two recent cases that come out of the Olympics and that have been or are about to be heard in our BC courts. The first of these is the ski jumpers case and actually I lie when I say I'm going to focus on it because I'm going to mention it and then I'm going to leave it aside but I'm happy to talk about it in more detail in the questions that follow because I've been doing quite a bit of thinking about it. So the first is the ski jumpers equality challenge to Van Ock that was recently dismissed by the Court of Appeal. And the second is a challenge that has just been initiated to the restrictive speech bylaws that have come out of our city council. And I take these cases as poles to locate or ground my discussion because in my mind, they, they evoke two key values that I care deeply about in structuring what I would like to be a just Canadian society, and those are the values of substantive equality and free expression. And I'm going to spend some time talking about free expression because it's the title of this panel. So I'm going to go there and not to the equality. But I want to ground discussion of some of the facts around the free expression issues in a broader set of theoretical insights that I find really provocative in thinking about what's going on in our urban environment with the entry of the Olympics into it. And I begin really by um, going to urban geographer David Harvey's work on what he calls the right to the city. And lots of people are talking about this in the context of the Olympics. And, and David Harvey takes, he's a British um, urban geographer, starts off in his own work by citing the sociologist Robert Park who said, and here I'm quoting Park, the city is the world which man created. It is the world in which he, and I would say he or she, or she or he, is henceforth condemned to live. 
And Harvey transforms this struggle over the urban environment, or the fact that for so many of us, this shapes our understanding of ourselves. Um, he conforms it into human rights ideals, and he talks about the collective right to the city. And he takes Park's insight to assert that the kind of city we have is about the kind of people we are, the kinds of social relations we seek, the style of our daily lives, and so on. And what he says the right to the city is, is the freedom to take advantage of what the city has to offer, but also to make and to recreate what the city has to offer. So it's not the right to what, it's not simply right to what already exists, but the right to change what exists, to imagine and to bring about a new city. So to imagine the city as you want it to be and then to make it that way is what he means by the right to the city, to have this power over shaping the city and thus to really make and remake ourselves and how we understand ourselves. Now a big part of Harvey's um, discussion of the right to city is about capitalism and how indeed capitalism's perpetual need to find surface, sorry, to find uh, profitable terrain for surplus production and absorption has actually shaped the course of our cities and the rights of private property and capital have established class tensions and injustices in the city and set up what our ideals of urban identity and citizenship are, but most importantly set them up in a way that's unjust. Now, I understand this idea of a right to city, of a collective right to city, what we do together as a community collectively to shape our environment in the city and what the city does, how it shapes us, as really a right to substantive citizenship, to a, a right to have input into, to matter in the discussion of what we, the society we inhabit. And that's the link to these key values of substantive equality and expression for me because I think substantive citizenship rests upon substantive equality and employs as a way of expressing and moving forward in that citizenship expression and freedom of expression. So in my mind, the sort of starting backdrop to the discussion of the specifics of what's happening concretely and legally and uh, sort of politically in Vancouver around the Olympics is this idea of how do we go about shaping a just, inclusive, equitable society and how is that not happening with what's happening around the Olympics? And of course there's a really obvious link between the demands of capitalism and capitalism's appropriation of democratic governance and the IOC's sort of I don't know how to describe them, they're circulating in the ether around everything that happens in Vancouver and sort of having great force on what happens, comes out of our city council and what our police and security forces do. So, so that's where I'm coming from in terms of sort of a larger, more abstract consideration of why these concrete details matter. But let me get to some of the concrete details and then I, we're all going to tie in together and then I'm going to stop talking soon because I'm, I think we're all really keen to engage with you guys and to hear um, what you have to say. But, so I'm going to leave the ski jumpers aside except to say that in my mind it's a classic equality slam dunk. And it's also a really good illustration of how these sort of funnily shaped organizations that are both public and private and neither at the same time escape kind of legal regulation, this sort of 21st century capitalism and it's very powerful at play and the Olympics I think is a classic example in some really provocative ways of that. But the ski jumpers case is a slam dunk or I don't know how to do a ski jumping metaphor like a flying aerial whatever um, of inequality and, and there are legal intricacies about why they couldn't get there but it, but it definitely shows that there are problems of inequality, of sex inequality in particular at the heart of what's known, uh, what the IOC calls the Olympic tradition. Now equality is the central value. My, my nine-year-old daughter set my watch to go off at six o'clock every evening and I keep forgetting to change it so it just went off. Um, the, Equality is a central value, or at least part of the central rhetoric and principles of the Canadian state. So the charter is an obvious place where we see that expressed, but it occurs throughout the legislative area. And so I do think that in our constitution and in our constellation of political principles, equality is really fundamental. And so it's a key part of how we understand ourselves in our best sense. Now, so I'm going to leave that aside, but just to flag it as part of 
a really interesting event that raises these larger sets of issues out there. And I'm going to move now to the free speech um, part of my presentation. And I want to locate it first in terms of these Vancouver bylaws that, that Rob talked about and that many of you may already be familiar with. So we saw in June the passage of an omnibus package of amendments to various municipal bylaws, you know, temporary buildings could be allowed, round-the-clock deliveries were allowed, changes to the noise regulations, um, closing streets near, near venues, designating certain areas as certain zones, and so on. But as a critical part of this, of course, there were a set of restrictions that I'll detail in a minute um, that were about what kind of expression would be possible in what areas are really not possible in what areas of the city and in relation to what aspects of Olympic venues. Now this legislation has been vigorously criticized, particularly by Dave Eby, or I would say most effectively by Dave Eby of the BC Civil Liberties Association. It's also been defended most adamantly perhaps by Jeff Meigs of the City Council. And what you have, however, is um, a, a piece of legislation that very clearly on its face has really quite draconian, I would say, restrictions on speech. And I'll just pause for a moment to remind you that this bylaw is not the first time that we've had some limiting of who gets to do what on the streets of Vancouver. So keep in the back of your mind, too, that over the last, let's say, five to ten years, we've seen the Safe Streets Act passed. Um, we've seen changes to the streets and traffic bylaw that regulate where you can panhandle, whether you can loiter, loiter on city streets or not. And we have currently pending at the provincial, I don't think it's passed yet, at the provincial legislature something called the Assistance to Shelter Act that allows forcible removal of individuals from the street into a shelter in times of extreme weather conditions, which I think uh, is like four to five days of rain. We're actually in the middle of an extreme weather condition right now. So I'll leave that behind, but this is not the first time that we've seen the sort of unpleasant, those who make us uncomfortable, pushed off the public spaces of our street. But what are the pieces that I want to talk about or focus on here in the bylaw? Well, first of all, the bylaw prohibits the un license, that is, without license from Vanock, distribution of advertising material or carrying any sign basically on, on city property um, and on city streets. Um, it prohibits putting up any sign other than is explicitly celebrator celebratory, um, so that celebrates the Olympics. So there's a really tight restriction um, in uh, the legislation about uh, anything that doesn't have to do with Van Ock or isn't from a licensed sponsor or that isn't celebratory and positive and enthusiastic about the Olympics. And the kinds of spaces where this speech is restricted um, is, of course, very, very broad. So it's the Vancouver Public Library, it's the Roundhouse Community Centre, it's a couple other community centres, it's a whole broad swath of, of public major streets in, in the city. So it's it's very um, broad in the text, despite what its defenders say about it not possibly being used to do anything than capture ambush marketing. It clearly has the textual authority to do that, and it's punishable by a, sign, a fine of $2,000. Now, why would the city pass something like this? Well, it's contractually obligated by the host city agreement to, perv to keep the venues clean. So there's this whole clean venue policy, which means that when the TV cameras pick up various Olympic events, they don't want any noise, any unauthorized expression on the TV cameras. And so our streets are being cleansed for the Olympic, the venues are being cleansed, and it even goes down to being able to say, you know, what kind of t-shirts, what slogans on t-shirts people who pay to get in and have a ticket can wear when they go to see their event. Well, two individuals, Chris, Chris Shaw and Alyssa West, Westergaard Thorpe, have commenced an action last month against the city of Vancouver, claiming that there's a potential, not potential, but anticipatory infringement of their free expression rights under the Charter. And they say they have two kinds of speech that are at issue. The first is, and they say this in the, the writ that initiates the action, that they intend to express and communicate their thoughts and opinions with Vancouverites and visitors, politicians and attendees to the site, pedestrians and commuters using the corridor by using city sites and corridors to do this wearing critical t-shirts, buttons, badges, hats, and other apparel to distribute leaflets and posters and to erect and carry signs 
um, on city sites and in the games. So they're, they are going to do it all, all the stuff they can't do. They also go on to say that Chris Shaw, who's a, actually a UBC neuro-ophthalmologist, has uh, written a book called The Five Ring Circus, and he intends to, throughout the course of the city on all the prohibited sites, uh, speak, advertise his book, to go on and talk about, to talk about his book and its content with the goal of increasing signs of his book. So we see that they intend to do two kinds of speech, political speech and commercial speech. He wants to go out and sells books as well. And they're saying that the prevention of both these kinds of activities is contrary to the Charter. Well, interesting, and I know I'm running out of time, the most recent case from the Supreme Court of Canada that is the guide for whether or not they've got a case here, I think sets out pretty clearly that they do have a case. And I think it was obvious from the get-go that this bylaw raises constitutional problems. And what really is absolutely extraordinary is that it got through city council. And it shows you the control and the kind of disciplining of our democratic municipal government that these Olympic folks are being successful in. Anyway, so the Supreme Court has said that broad swaths of activity are protected by the Charter. If you're trying to convey meaning and you're not violently doing so, it's protected speech. Now, if you're on government property, there's another qualification. Government property gives the government some property rights. It doesn't give them full property rights in terms of getting people's speech off their property. It gives them limited ones. And so if you want to do your speech on public property, you've got to show that the public property on which you do want to do that speech is traditionally or currently used for the exchange of ideas and that the exchange of ideas you want to take place, you want to have take place is consistent with the purposes. So if you want to go into the parliamentary library, arguably and shout or, I don't know, you know, have a, a new bake sale or something to make a point, it may not be consistent with the purposes of the parliamentary library and you may actually not get foothold in the charter to say that you're being turfed out of the library is contrary to the charter. But if you want to do speech in the parks, in the Vancouver Library, it's a downtown library, you know, that big space where everyone always holds their events, in a park, and so on, then that's the place that traditionally is about public speech. And that, there the government will have difficulty saying they can exercise their property rights to throw you off. So if the historical or action function of the place is both a place of speech and what you want to do is consistent with the purpose of that place, then you pretty much have an easy way to say that your freedom of expression rights have been infringed. And indeed, that's what Chris Shaw and Westergaard Thorpe will be able to do. And so the real issue here is going to be how the government's going to justify under Section 1 of the Charter, because once you show an infringement of right, the government has essentially another kick at the can. They can say, well, that's demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society, and they can infringe the right constitutionally. So that's, I think, where the, the, the real issue will be, and essentially is the lawyer for um, these two individuals said there, it's just going to be the case of Chris Shaw versus Coke and McDonald's. Because, of course, who are the big speakers during the Olympics? Who are the ones with all the expressive rights in space? It's these corporate monsters like Coke and McDonald's. Now, the cities responded to this case in a couple of ways. First of all, they filed their statement of response with a thick bundle of affidavits in support of their argument that there's no constitutional problem. But they've also scheduled the day after they have a meeting with the judge on Tuesday for a pretrial conference. The day after the conference, a meeting with the BC Civil Liberties Association. And it's expected that they're going to say, we're going to amend this bylaw. And they're going to amend it so that it's clear that it's only commercial speech that's prohibited. So the kind of political speech that's the first part of the case, the protesting, the criticism of the Olympics with hats and banners and pins and t-shirts and flyers and balloons and so on, will actually not be caught by bylaw. But the framing of the action by these two individuals has been clever because they're not merely saying they want to do political speech, they're also saying they want to do commercial speech. They have a product to sell and it's Chris Shaw's book that is critical of the Olympics. So Chris Shaw, even in the face of what would be a pretty called for an obvious amendment of the bylaw, will still have a case to go forward and that's why the case will be Chris Shaw versus Coke and McDonald in the justification stage of the Charter analysis. So to wrap up, let's come back to this notion of the right to the city of equal, meaningful, substantive citizenship in shaping our shared collective social, legal, and political environment. And, and I think we need to think about what happens to public space in these moments 
because of course the way in which we engage in shaping our city is going to take place on public space, particularly for those who have no private space, who don't own newspapers, who may live in the streets at one extreme. And the transformation that's threatened of our public shared space into a private space that's public only for a particular class of entitled individuals. The shaping of the space for speech, this critical civic activity, the marker of citizenship or presence or being in the city of even those who make us uncomfortable, particularly uncomfortable about our own affluence and privilege or choices we've made in the pursuit of the capitalist dream. Who uses this space? Who counts as the public? Who do you exclude from the public? And I think that these are, you know, I've talked about some of the immediate issues, but the larger issues of what's going on with our civic space with the rolling out of the Olympics in it. So I, I think that the, the appropriate response is to look at all of those, and, and if, if the countervailing um, question is security, say, okay, well, where, you know, where at a legitimate level do, does, does uh, the expression have to yield? And, uh, and the balance r right now, uh, at least from my point of view, is, is extremely at one end of that spectrum. And, and there's all sorts of ways in which there are restrictions that, that that you have a really tough time in finding any even tenuous connection to a security concern, like the sign bottle. Thank you. And, and I suppose uh, going along with that, that historically, um, at other Olympics or other events like this, both in Canada, have we seen um, restrictions on speech at this scale? Uh, how was it viewed internationally? What was the response? Mm -hmm. yeah, I can't think off the top of my head about uh, any comparisons. Uh, but um, I, really, all I can do is just echo uh, Daniel's point that, uh, that, but for the policy on the part of the Olympic Committee, I, I don't see, um, you know, I, I don't think that uh, freedom of expression would have, would have been an issue at all. It would just have been like any other sporting event. I, I mean, there's no security issue, really, uh, or there shouldn't have been. Uh, and, and so it seems to be uh, the case that security is being used as a, as a justification for advancing other purposes. But, you know, can I jump in? Because Vanoff actually, in its clean venue policy, so the interesting thing about this is that there, there's the public speech of the officials. So what the police say, what city councillors say, what the Vanoff website say, what the, says, what the integrated security units, spokesperson or website say. But there are also all these underlying documents. So if you, if you hunt through the morass of sort of public statements saying, don't worry, you get to the actual texts. And so the IOC has a number of policies that it sends to the local organizing, the, the, the National Olympics Organizing Committee, or whatever it's called, which is VANOC, that contractually VANOC is bound to adhere to. So there's a host city agreement that VANOC signs with the IOC. I mean, that's the reason we got the bylaws is because Vanoff was threatening to sue the city if they didn't do this. They've got this contractual agreement to get this clamp down on s speech that's static to the Olympic purpose in the Olympic host city. And so there's a clean venues document that says it's about a number of things. It's about protecting those sponsors who have paid the money to be Olympic sponsors because they won't do it again if they don't have sole 
monopoly of voice in the venues. It's about preserving the sort of Olympic positive atmosphere of the Olympics. And, and so there's a whole list of things. And, and, and so security is one of those things. But it's also importantly the idea that the Olympics is this product that you have to roll out unblemished. And part of the product is this raw, raw, nary, what is that home on the range where never an unpleasant word is, you know that line, home, home, and never an unpleasant word is heard. It's sort of like the home on the range version of the Olympics, right? There can be nothing out there that detracts from the completely positive messaging about the Olympics. And, and I'll go back to your first question and think, like, how, how comfortable is that with the values of Canadian society? And when we bring this program to Canada and invest so many public resources in it, how comfortable do we feel with the fact that it runs counter to, I mean, our constitutionally espoused values of equality and freedom of expression, but also part of our understanding of ourselves politically as we express it in our best statements? Not always, I mean, we're a country marked by gender inequality, but we aspire to be better, at least, in our best moments. And, and so I, you know, I think there are, there, there are a lot of bases on which we can say this is not okay for who we are and the kind of society we want to we create to have events that present this sort of corporate managed, you know, kind of dumbed down, positive gaga-ing about the Olympics. All right. Uh, thank you. And um, so this actually has a very good answer to my next question, I guess, in that um, how has, what, what has the role of the press been in this so far, and um, how is this being seen and messaged to the public? And I think uh, maybe I have a better answer uh, for that than that too. Yeah, I picked that up. It's an interesting transition. The press is is changing from a, from a, you know, I mean, full disclosure. I represent you know a whole bunch of big media, but I also represent a lot of little people too. And uh, um, press, even in the couple of years since the last Olympics, the world has changed, and and what constitutes media um, has has begun to encompass. Um, you know, a whole category of people who actually think can make quite a difference in this Olympics. Um, citizen journalists, for example, and, and you know, as, as one broad, broad category. And, uh, and there have been, as, as we've been following it, a number of the, of the security concerns uh, or the, uh, you know, the venue definitions and things like that, that, that those have come to light, um, you know, through reporters digging. So, so applause to them. But there's also a lot of stuff as we go forward that can, you know, that, the, the few newspapers in town and television stations in town can only be so many places. Um, you know, as this thing sort of unfolds, um, you know, all the eyes of all the citizens um, can, can play an important role in, in defining things. We've had this weird thing where, where, you know, the eyes of Big Brother have sort of turned around, and all of a sudden, you know, th there's an accountability factor when somebody is videotaping uh, tasering at the airport. And those kinds of things really do change behavior if, if, if there's an accountability. It, and, you, and you think of everybody as being as being um, as being sort of a witness to what's going on. But you know, Dan, I think there's a really interesting con contrast between what alternative media is saying about the Olympics and what mainstream media is saying mm -hmm. about the Olympics. And Can West has a stake, aren't they? Like they, ha they Can West is part of the Olympic family, mm -hmm. and coverage of articles critical of the Olympics is really just you know it's not a feature. I would say of the Vancouver Sun, the province, or the Globe and Mail particularly. The stuff that I find most useful in sort of telling me about what's going on at a municipal level is the TAI, which is an online alternative uh, medium or, or uh, source. And so there's a long history of the media being complicit in the corporate agenda, or at least the established media being complicit in the corporate agenda of the Olympics. And so there's a woman called Helen Lensky, who's a a sports sociologist at University of Toronto, and she's written in some depth about the way in which reporters really, you know, have also, I mean, they get, there are parties held for reporters, there are perks, there are, there's, a, there's an entanglement often of the established press with the larger Olympic organization, and, and she's documented this 
in terms of other cities' Olympic bids and in coverage of Olympic issues in other Olympic host cities. So the picture is a complicated one. It's not a simple picture of, gee, now we're in a world where with the internet and the citizen reporter, we're actually getting really good coverage. It's still a word where there's a media concentration in a few corporate hands and a reluctance of those hands to get themselves dirty with a critical discussion of the Olympics, I think. And I don't know, I may have stated yeah. it strongly, but I think it's a really important picture of thinking about the media's role here. And where are you getting your news about some of the critical commentary that's going on around the bylaw, around what's happened at UBC with the tenancy agreements? Um, I don't know, I find the tie is way better than, than any of the newspapers. Well, the tie is terrific, and, and you know, there's a whole other debate about media concentration and all that, I'll own, and, I, and I'm conflicted to get into it, like literally in a conflict, but, but, I, but, I, um, but I will say that I, from, from what I've seen over 20 odd years of acting for big and small media, um, the ethic of journalists is actually pretty strong. Uh, where, where the issue arises is often resources and, and, and where those resources end up going. So maybe that's Also editorial way. policy. That's a key part of what you, you know, I, you know, I've had events I've been at where you've had a reporter write up a story and take photos and he can't get it in the paper because he can't get it past the editorial board. And it's a, there's a, there's, it is politics, certainly, around uh, media that's a piece of this. I, I just wanted to add that um, the role of the media in, in this picture is also affected by, um, by just how uh, uh, well information has been, you could say, policed. I, I, I don't want to say concealed because I, you know, we, we don't know, even know whether that's what's, what's happening. But we do know that there's, um, that there's a division of powers going on. There's, you know, the VPD will have some role in security in the Olympics and uh, there's a separate unit of the RCMP that's been created for this. Um, and and they're, they're constantly negotiating uh, what rule or where the dividing line uh, is and so forth. And in the process of this, there hasn't been a lot of clarity about what exactly is going to happen. So, so maybe some, you know, some part of why there's so much discretion in the bylaw is that uh, maybe you know, there's a desire to uh, withhold, conceal for security reasons, some information about what precisely they intend to do. Or maybe there's confusion, but the point is that we just don't know. So, I mean, I've been tracking media coverage of this, and what strikes me is just how much coverage there is, but how little information there really is. If you see what I mean, like, you know, we're following it with Google and so on. And, um, and so uh, that, that also factors in. And, and I don't know that there's a simple solution to that. I mean, how much credit do we give the, uh, the authorities when they say that we need to be careful about what information we do disclose about our security strategy for the Olympics? I just pose that as a question. But it's also part, a large part about accountability of these organizations who spend so much public money and have such a displacement effect on our public space. And Bannock is very non-transparent. So its meetings are not open to the public. There's no way to get the minutes of the meeting. The IOC is apparently one of the most non-transparent organizations in the world. Like even under Swiss law, it's highly secretive and inaccessible in terms of knowing what it's up to. And um, one of the things you do to protect public rights is demand accountability. And that's really, I think, a missing piece of how our hosting of the Olympics has rolled out. We didn't have accountability measures to ensure that someone was tracking and holding these people to their promises of, say, social sustainability or protection of civil liberties. And, uh, you know, if you don't have accountability measures, you often get power not being wielded in uh, the most justifiable way. And so I think that's a clear lesson we've learned, or at least I think we should learn. From these Olympics. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last question from us, and then we'll move forward. And uh, hopefully, we'll speak some of the short, maybe in four minutes, so we have lots of time for your questions. Um, and I guess it's going to be, as well, looking out at the media, and that, uh, of course, that's going to, this is, these are the stories that presumably are being reported elsewhere in the world. And has there been any international reaction to some of these uh, bylaws or things that are happening here in Canada? I don't know. <laughs> There's been a complaint filed with the United Nations by a local group, right? To the, um, the Human Rights Committee, I think, one of the bodies administering the Covenant on Civil Rights. I might be wrong, but they've got, that that's where they went, but they've gone to the United Nations Committee to try and get some uh, assessment of whether what's happening complies with Canada's international human rights observations. There's been a, there's been a visit fra uh, by uh, 
a researcher from a Geneva-based NGO think tank that looks at the impact on housing and homelessness of these mega events and that has a very interesting report, I think from like 2005, documenting how every one of these events in the past has displaced uh, the most marginalized and disempowered members of society. So they go through Expo, for example, is in their report. Uh, you know, lauded as this great big party for us, but resulted in 2,000 people being, being displaced from their homes in the inner city core. And that kind of information is actually why we ended up with the social sustainability commitments. So, we, you know, people said we don't want that to happen again. So there's some international oversight interest in what's happening in Vancouver, and there's quite a bit of commentary about whether or not we're going to fit the pattern of mega events like expos, World Cups, and Olympics to date around the world, which has been that they come at severe costs to, uh, uh, to sort of social issues like housing and also to civil liberties. So certainly scrutiny and people are interested. I'll just add that I, I haven't been following the, the, the international coverage in any language other than English, but, um, but it, it, it seems as though uh, the things that we're debating are being picked up uh, outside of Canada. For example, Bloomberg did a story today or yesterday that just kind of summarized you know, where we're at in general terms for American readers. And I've, I've seen stories in the British press and so on, um, which suggests to me, uh, or, or leads me to believe that I wouldn't be surprised if this does, this does become one of the subtexts or one of the kind of, one of the narratives during the Olympics, um, given that we have a legal system that has a high, you know, a high degree of commitment to these values, yet um, the trend in, uh, the Olympics uh, over the last, say, 10 years and uh, in events of this nature is, is to um, execute them with a degree of security that's kind of inconsistent with, with this body of law. And so I wonder whether the media will make this into, the, into one of the main stories of the Olympics. I, uh, I'll be curious to see. Yeah, it's interesting. The ski jumpers case certainly got coverage in papers in London, the New York Times, the NPR, National Public Radio Station in the States. Like, the sort of English-speaking world is interested in it, and probably some of the Northern Europeans as well, because ski jumping is their sport. Right. Uh, okay, so now it's time for you to ask your questions. Questions you have for our panelists. I have to give a microphone up here if you uh, feel your voice is not quite strong. Where are you sitting? So, uh, what's happening? Hi, Jeff. Uh, thank you for this talk. Uh, I was wondering justification, how that could have ever come about that they would exclude the female sea jumpers? Like, how would they have ever thought that that would be all right and it wouldn't have occurred to them that people might get angry about this? Well, the justification is that they don't have the degree of universality yet that's required for admission into the Olympics. And there's actually a rule that stipulates you have to have a certain number of competitors in a certain number of countries across three continents in order to have a developed enough sport to get into the Olympics. And the women's ski jumpers clearly don't meet that rule. The issue is that the men's ski jumpers don't either, and that a number of other sports don't either. And so you have a clear case of letting the men in and not letting the women in when both don't meet the rule. And the men have been grandfathered in by virtue of a statement that they're part of the Olympic tradition because men's ski jumping has been there since the first Olympics game. And so they get in because they're part of the Olympic tradition, but they became part of the Olympic tradition when it was clear that women, you know, were not considered to be appropriate athletes. I mean, there's statements from just five years ago uh, by the president of the federation, the, the, the ski jumping federation that to the effect, I'm sort of paraphrasing, for comic value, but women would burst their uteruses upon hitting the ground. We need to actually use the word uterus. But that's the implication. And so there's a real history of sexist attitudes towards women, in particular to show women ski jumping, that explains why men got in in the early 20th century and women didn't. And then what you have now is a grandfathering of that sexist treatment of men in so that they get to come in despite not meeting the rules when the women don't. So the formal line is that women don't have the degree of universality yet, and when they do, the IOC will be thrilled to admit them as a, an Olympic sport. Okay. Another question here. Just to follow up on that, will they actually be thrilled? Because in my experience, having been a spectator and a participant in the Olympics, um, when 
when they want to move new people into a sport, right? thinking uh, particularly about the summer games, somebody else has or some other event has to go away because they want to cap the number. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's still what they do, but if so, there's another issue. So I, don't, I don't know if that's what they would do. And the interesting thing about the women's ski jumpers is you know, the run's already built. Mm -hmm. um, there's already time on it. So I'm not sure how much displacement putting the women in. And they only went into one of the three ski jumping events, how much that would result in. And there have been other events that have been recently admitted that fall below these universality guidelines. But I had a really interesting argument that these events were admitted because they sort of capture the youth and they're really good marketing events. And so there's this commercial interest there. And ski jumping is this sort of high bound rate of passage from boyhood to manhood, apparently, in some of European countries. Or it has that history of it. I was talking to a sports sort of sociologist about it. And so there's, um, there's that reason for them not getting in when these other sports have. But I think this has been a major embarrassment to the IOC. Been covered internationally. They've been told by the BC Supreme Court that it's a clear act of sex discrimination. I think the. I mean, I just don't think they can go on much longer. But to save face, it's not going to happen now for the 2010. That would be my sense of it. But anyway, the ski jumpers is such a um, accessible and fascinating topic. But um, it, the way it sort of mixes in with the speech issues, I think, is really interesting in terms of. The, the it's kind of law and politics mixing together around the Olympics. Um, well, speaking to the, the IOC laws, like obviously the IOC is a very undemocratic organisation, but what can it really do at this stage to ban up into the city if they don't uh, abide by their rules? What, what, can, what can the IOC do? Um, well, you know, it, it's an interesting point. I mean, from a, looking at, you know, the example of the, the ski jumpers, the, I mean, the problem has been that the, the, the courts are, are more or less powerless to do anything to IOC because they're not a government. The charges don't apply to them. But when you flip it around, when you're in the moment and, and during during the Olympics and... and uh, you know, the city were to, you know, to develop a political will to, to, um, to allow a level of protest that the IOC doesn't like, there's not a lot that can be done. And, uh, you know, and, and, and I, I think part of it is, is that you won't find sort of explicit prohibitions. It's, it's how far you push what you know, what you know, reach a level of, un of uncomfortability with the IOC. And, and, uh, and I think, you know, the, you know, cities around the world, even countries around the world, um, you know, they, there's a halo effect. They, they don't want, don't pay off the IOCs, you know, and, and so they stay a mile away from anything that might make them uncomfortable. Um, and, and developing a bit more courage is, is, is part of it. So even even short of breaking a rule, I think ju just coming up to the line is, is uh, would be an accomplishment. I was just going to say, I mean, what, what I could see happening is uh, that the IOC and Vanock have entered into contracts with, with companies to advertise. And, if, um, and one of the assumptions, one of the, one of the conditions in that contract would be that, that it will be quiet, that you know, you, your message will get across, and it won't be interfered with and so on. So if it, does, if it doesn't play out that way, then maybe um, the corporations will then sue uh, the IOC and Vanock, who will then in, will then sue the city and, and the government of Canada. I mean, it could, be, could play out that way, but, but as Daniel suggests, that's going to be all after the fact. So, um, you know, it'll just depend on how, how it turns out, and if it's, I mean, I guess we'll revisit it then. And if it's found to be unconstitutional to actually do what the contract tells them to do, I don't think they could sue on an unconstitutional obligation on the part of the government to the cities, right? But, but... Hmm. But, you know, what, a, the ski jumpers case, somebody, the Canadian who's on the IOC, whose name I'm just blanking on, Dick Pound, basically said, you won't get another Olympics Canada if, if you do this. And, and they couldn't put the women on the jump because the international, the country's own ski jump federations, which send the athletes, won't cross the IOC. They get funding and they get status and they get accreditation from the IOC. And the IOC, you, you can't give a medal, an Olympic medal, because it's a copyrighted by the IOC. So, 
you know, the most Van Ock could do is to refuse to have the men there or have the men in another country. So that's, I mean, the, there's this interesting thing about the fact that it's actually a franchise in a way. And you only have permission to use it for what the IOC says you do. Now, in terms of the bylaw, I think if the city's told they can't have as restrictive a policy over even commercial speech by the courts, don't you think Van Ock will just have to put up with that because it's our constitution? And they've got an agreement, right, that the Olympics will be delivered in accordance with Canadian law, which surely includes constitution which is at the top of the heap yeah, I think right. so I think they'll just eat it up but but the, but I think there's a psychology that's like it's like a high school you know you want to these are the, this, this is the cool group the IOC and when you want to roll your product in a way that they like you and you want to be a good part of the Olympic don't you think this sort of psychology and you get blinkered in these things and that's part of what having a clean space does is people lose perspective and they become invested you know, there's like, it's, there are these rules, I can't remember, if you're a business administration student, you'd know them about the way you get caught up in the immediate goal and you forget the larger goal. And, and I think there's a sort of mindset now that no criticism is good and they don't want any noise because they're completely invested in giving the Olympics the way the IOC wants it. And there's a amount of stroking and being part of the in game to not run up against the IOC. That's just part of kind of human group psychology, and I say that with absolutely no expertise that enables me to make that conclusion, but except for having gone to high school. Um, but I think that's a piece of what of, of what's going on. Sure. Uh, another question? Yes. Well, we've talked a lot about the It's hard to imagine that there wasn't some very significant protest going on at that point, and yet, and yet, uh, it kind of gets drowned out by the PR machine a little bit. So, so that's the only example that I can think of where, where it's, you know, you know, at the time of those Olympics, I never heard about that. It was only actually as we started contemplating the Olympics coming here, and we started looking at issues like that. These started finding out, wow, that's that's pretty significant. Why wasn't that a major news story? Um, you know, so so um, I suspect there's a lot more local protest that, you just, that you just doesn't kind of filter its way at, uh, across the continent. Hmm. I think there's been local protest at every one of the recent Olympics, but we don't know about it. But I also think Vancouver has a really vibrant civil society. Mm -hmm. We have some really great uh, municipally based kind of activist groups here. So Pivot, the BC Civil Liberties, civil Liberties Association, a whole bunch of groups that were formed at the time the bid was put together that have been, some of them actually were very influential in forming the agreement about, you know, what the conditions of the Olympics would be before the municipal vote or plebiscite um, on it. And I think we have some really committed and dedicated activists who have given quite a high profile to these issues. Um, along with the, I don't think the internet's a feature, like even more so now than, than ever. And then having the charter available, you get a lot of, I mean, the ski jumpers case got publicity because it went to court. And you can't do that unless you have a constitutional bill of rights that gives you access to the courts. And so if you think about the courts, not as simply a legal response, but actually a moment in a larger political struggle that gives you, even when you lose, quite a bit of public space to make your case and to educate people and to convince people. We've seen that happen here, and so, you know, lots of cases go to the court, not with the hope of winning, but with the hope of being a moment in a larger, ultimately successful political strategy. I think the point about the internet is a really important one. I mean, it, the, um, it's important that there be, you know, physical, on the ground uh, expression, and people have the right to, to do that. Um, but to the extent that that is thwarted, despite the best of efforts and the best of, 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 of you know, work by 
we see civil liberties and so forth. Um, you know, we're moving to a point in time when, when all of those, all of that sort of PR control kind of can't be controlled anymore. You know, they, they, they might be able to put up a sign law and control what signs can be in town, but they sure can't control what's on, on the you know hundreds of thousands of computer monitors all over the town and all over the world. So, so um, you know, you may you may see that that's that's where where the uh, a lot of the um, diversity of opinion surfaces. How many of you were aware of these issues? Just know about them generally through what you read or talk about or see? Hmm. And of course you're kind of a self-selected group because you're here. <laughs> but I think there's a, quite a bit of public knowledge just in the general population um, or certain parts of the general population about the fact that these issues are out here around the Olympics. Yeah, the Georgia Strait has covered quite a bit of it, that's right. Yeah. 24 Hours has a reporter, like I can't remember his name, who's been doing quite a bit of this stuff too. You guys probably read that on the bus, right? Can I just ask a question uh, uh, that's taking us uh, off, uh, off the review? But, uh, Marco, what, what are your thoughts about how the, uh, the ski jump challenge might have turned out? It could have been otherwise, so they, they were, they're, they're trying to challenge it. But could it have succeeded? Well, there could, I mean, I would say yes, it could have. Plausibly, according to the jurisprudence, and that's what the Supreme Court, at the, the BC Supreme Court did for part of the judgment, plausibly they could have won their case. And the case had, really the key issue is whether Vanock is government or not, because the charter only applies to government. So you can't use a charter against your landlord, your private employer, et cetera, but you can use it against government actors, government actions, pieces of legislation, government organizations. Now we live in a complex society. There are lots of institutions around us that look to be sort of governmental but not quite, and so that's the fault line of whether the charter applies or not. And you know, organizations fall on one side or other of it. So the university, you might think that should be something that the charter structures, well, it doesn't. It doesn't count as government according to the court, and so on. Um, but municipalities do, school boards probably do, that kind of thing. Well, Vanock, what is it? Is it governmental? Is it carrying out a government program? And the BC Supreme Court found, I think quite plausibly, I don't know what you guys think about the judge's reasons, that case law from the Supreme Court allowed her to say that Vanock is carrying out a government program such that it's subject to the charter obligations. The next stage is to say, okay, you're subject to the charter obligations, which means you have subject to the equality guarantees. Are you infringing them? She found that exclusion of the women's ski, jump ski jumpers was clear sex discrimination, but then she said it's being done by the IOC, not by Vanock. And I think that's kind of crazy reasoning, actually. I think that to do it in Section 15 that way doesn't make much sense, and, and it's probably not going to be convincing. But the fact that she got through the application to Section 15 in a convincing way, I think that's the hurdle they faced, or the jump they faced. And it was pretty plausible. So yeah, I mean, could you mount a case that's located in, just in case law, in precedent from the Supreme Court? I think you could plausibly. You'd be kind of pushing it in the margins, and I think a progressive way. But I don't know. What, what do you guys think? Yeah, I, I think getting over the government I mean, you know, the recent, there's a recent case from the Supreme Court of Canada holding the TransLink. Yeah, the transit just, authorities, the people who run the buses. Despite having a lot of, you know, it, you know, it not being directly government and sort yeah. of on that blurry line is sufficiently a government that the charter applies. And, and so once you get, get there with Van Ock, um, to then say they don't have to comply because somebody else is basically marching orders, I mean, it, 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 it is funny. Yeah. Me. So, so uh, w I would have thought once you're over the first hurdle that you'd want your home. You that's want. what I've thought too. But do you think uh, the Canadian courts could compel the IOC? No, but that's not what the case. I think they could say this is so. So they can't compel the IOC. They can't say anything to. I mean, they can't. They can say what they like to the IOC, but they have. You know, they're just like you and me saying it to the IOC. But they can compel Vanock. And so what the ski jumpers clarified at the court appeal that they wanted was the court to simply declare that holding ski jumping for men only was unconstitutional. It's up to Van Ock to figure out what it does about it. Now there are lots of options, right? There, I think there are three. They could persuade the IOC to let the women in and scramble and get them on the ramp, which some people say is possible. They could exclude the men. And that's called equality with, equality with a vengeance. Okay, if we can only give it to, if we have to give it to everybody. We can't just give it to you, then we give it to nobody. That's equality. We just lower everybody down to the bottom. So they could not have any ski jumping, which would have had the Northern Europeans in hysterics, apparently, because ski jumping is such an important sport 
to Norwegians, I understand, in particular. Um, or they could have said, we'll hold the men's ski jumping in another country. We'll go to somebody who has a ski jump from a past Winter Olympics and have it there. I think those were, I don't know, maybe there are other options. But, but the court wouldn't have said what to do. They just would have said, having the men only is unconstitutional. It's against Canadian law, and you're in breach of Canadian law if you do that. And Van Ock would have had to comply. It could work out how it complied. And the IOC, one suspects, presented with that picture of basically either let the women in or have no ski jumping at all or move the men to another country. I suspect, even though they said they wouldn't, probably could have been convinced to do it. Might have given Canada a black mark. But then you sort of think, well, if you don't want to come here because we respect human rights, then be gone with you, right? I mean, in a way. Well, not in a way. I would say that completely. So, yeah, don't, I mean, isn't that the remedy the court could have given? You figure out, but we'll tell you it's unconstitutional. Why do you think they didn't? My guess, and then I'd be interested to hear your guesses too, because they haven't given the reasons yet, right? They just told the ski jumpers after the last day of the hearing, your appeal's dismissed, you've been unsuccessful. You stand not to have made your case. I think they're going to do it on the application issue. I think they're going to say Van Ock's not subject to the charter. I don't know, what do you guys think? Yeah, I think that's right. Andrew, I'm never right, but that's what I would say now. What, what, what? I, I won't press it. Maybe we can no. chat about it. start, which is, you know, freedom of expression includes freedom to gather the information. Uh, and in fact, the Supreme Court is sitting on a decision about whether there's a constitutional right to information that, that even goes sort of beyond, like, freedom of information legislation. Um, when you're dealing with, with the flow of money, particularly to and from government, that's, that's one of the sort of core and most sort of, sort of high um, Areas in which freedom of information is meant to operate to hold accountability, and so, so you know, I'm um, optimistic. I guess is the best word I can I can put on it. That that, that requests that that will inevitably go in. I'm sure many already have to 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 you know get all that financial information in terms of where the resources went, uh, where they got taken from, um, you know, how it all panned out. Um, some of which we know now, some of which we won't know until after the Olympics. That will all flush out because, you know, there's certain exemptions to that legislation, but you can't really think of what would apply. You know, it's not, you know, it's not this, I mean, there's some policing stuff, I guess, to do with security, but that's, that's just, it's only a piece of it. So, so I, you know, and, and, and I, I'm hopeful that there will be people who, who really pursue that, that, that money angle as opposed to just, just sort of, um, you know, flashier stories. There's a debate over what the economic stimulus to the BC economy will be. So there, I think they had accounting firms, right? And there was an early one that put it at about, what was it? I, I, was it 10 billion? And it's now been downscaled to, is it four? I'm worried if I'm getting my billions and my millions mixed up because I know that makes a difference. Anyway, there's a debate and it's just, they've just downscaled what they expect sort of the economic benefit to be in terms of dollars. So it's being, it looks like it's going to be a bit less profitable than was originally stated. The interesting piece is how much money goes to Vanock. So Vanock gets the money from all the broadcasting rights. They give a piece as yet to be determined of that back to, sorry, the IOC gets the money from the broadcasting rights. They give a piece of that that's yet to be determined back to Vanock, and it's mm -hmm. kind of based, Vanock based on kind of performance things. And then how the IOC spends its money is much less transparent. They have sort of a number of things that they detail about where their money goes to. Um, but it's not clear about the amounts. But there's money going to the IOC from this as well. I 
don't think it is covered by the Act. I think it's covered by the Act. I don't think it is covered by the Act. I don't think it is covered by it. Because I think that the University Endowment Lands is different than the city of Vancouver. They have their own unique governance structure. They have some, you know, there's this whole thing now about zoning and that. There's this relationship worked out. But the Bannock did require the university to put a statement in the tenancy agreement. Is anyone here in residence? Anyone remember signing your tenancy agreement before you took up residency and that it had a statement in there that you agreed not to have any commercial signage from your window within sight of the Thunderbird Stadium? That was there at the request of Bannock, who was giving 37 out of $50 million towards the renovation of the Thunderbird Stadium for the events being held there, and the university was told to get the money. They had to put that in. That blew up this summer, and uh, Stephen Owen sent a letter around to everybody saying this applies only to commercial speech, not to political speech. The BC Civil Liberties Association and the Student Society, the MS, has been very active, and they've now had the university amend the tenancy agreements to say that it's only paid commercial expression that's prohibited. Are you guys familiar with this? Mm. Uh, yeah, it's so useful because the students are totally going to have paid advertisements in their windows. <laughs> well, it really means that there probably isn't an important freedom of expression issue anymore, but as it was originally framed, arguably there was, and the university has clarified it in light of the tradition of free expression on the university campus. Now, if they do restrict your expression, it's useful to know that the charter is no good to you because the charter doesn't apply to universities because, as I said before, they don't count as government for the purposes of charter application. I did, before today, started, went, went to the um, to the the bylaw and, and printed off you know, the, the map of, of what are considered venues for the purpose of that. UBC is not included there. There's gigantic swaths of, of Bank of, of the town that are, but UBC is not one of them as far as I can see. So, so that would suggest that, that there's, uh, it's not a restricted area as far as that goes. I don't think the bylaw speaks to UBC. Well, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering some of these bylaws that infringe on some of our civil liberties. With the Olympics being like 80 something days away, what are the real possibilities of change before they start? Change to, well, uh, to the law. Like the ones that are going before the court. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the bylaw could, the bylaw will likely be amended in, in some way. Uh, it, it could be, you know, relatively quickly. Um, and so I think could, uh, could the charter challenge be resolved Re relatively soon. Um, we do have a precedent, which I forgot to mention at the beginning, uh, of something like this, like a challenge to uh, security measures of this sort, and that's the Tremblay case in, in the Quebec City um, context. So in, in uh, when Quebec City was cordoned off, or large parts of it, a lawyer uh, by the name of um, Michael Tremblay brought a charge of challenge saying this is, this is contrary to freedom of movement and expression and so forth. And, uh, and it was heard, he, he saw an injunction, it was heard quickly. Um, but that was also the problem, because it was heard so quickly, the court didn't have the time to review um, the law to the extent that maybe it should have. And, and in that case, it, the, the whole regime, the, 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 you know, the, the creation of a really broad zone was found to be constitutional. So that was the one exception I should have mentioned at the beginning. But the reason that we don't include that included in our category of law that would support this is that it, it, it just runs contrary to every other um, every other piece of law that we found. But the gist is that in that case, uh, it, there was a, you know a quick trip to court and a quick decision you know within the, the 21 days or so that it went on. So um, I, I think that there there will be um, a lot more activity on the legal front between now and February. But but the point is the point is an important one because. You know, the, it raises the question, well, okay, you know, we've, we've, planning's been in the works for a long time. For, to take the city bylaws, for example, why wasn't that enacted a year ago? You know, I mean, I think we'd, we'd all be naive to think that it was only enacted recently, um, you know, and, and that had nothing to do with not having enough time to, to properly challenge it. And the thing about the bylaws, it only, it's only in effect from January, some date in January to some date in March. And so it's this narrow little window. And so I, I, I'm with you there. Like, I wonder, I mean, the bylaw is, on its face, it's so constitutionally problematic. Mm. And then it gets enacted, like, in June. And, it, you know, the wheels of justice turn slowly. 
And it's maybe a bit of a surprise that we've got a pretrial conference with the judge next week to the people involved in the city that they got to court that that quickly. Maybe they were hoping, I don't know, I mean, maybe in another scenario it would have been caught up in a lot more procedural wrangling had the lawyers been a bit more aggressive in defense I think it of still will. the bylaw. <laughs> but yeah, but they've got, you know, they've, yeah. they've got a judge and they've got a pretrial yeah. conference. And by the time you actually got the court to say anything, that January to March period would have expired and it would be a, a moot point. Now, the ski jumpers case got a really expedited hearing and result at the Court of Appeals. So you can wait a year to get a judgment from the Court of Appeal, and they got it in two days. Now, we'll get written reasons sometime this week, maybe a week later, but they did that because of the time frame. But the stop to the ski jumpers is the length of time it would take them to apply for leave to appeal, to get the Supreme Court to give permission to appeal to them to have the oral hearing at the Supreme Court and then to have the decision comes. So they're kind of stopped by the time frame. But this case about the speech issue doesn't appear to be, and they appear to be achieving politically a large part of what they were seeking to achieve legally, which is the interesting impact that actually going to court can have on the larger politics, how you can, inter you can influence it.